Welcome to the Ghoul's Guide to Santa Barbara. Don't trouble yourself, ma'am. Tuberculosis finished us off more than half a century ago. I'm just waiting for the one time where someone says a quote and I'm like, oh, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a ghost speaking? Yes. If tuberculosis finished them off. Yes. Mm. Is it a British film? <laughs> Not necessarily. It is set sort of in the UK. Yes, in the UK. Hmm. <laughs> I don't think 20 questions is going to get me there. <laughs> the hint is, until this moment, you don't know that the person's a ghost. There were two movies around oh! this time that had a twist. Yes, it's the Nicole Kidman one. Yes. Oh, the, uh, the others? The others. Yeah. 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 Yay, we got one. <laughs> <laughs> From the 2001 film The Others, directed by Alejandro Amenabar and starring Nicole Kidman, Fanula Flanagan, Elaine Cassidy, and very briefly, the ninth doctor, Christopher Eccleston. Oh, nice. Set in 1945 on the British Channel Island of Jersey, which was op- occupied by the Germans during the war, Second World War, and was cut off from mainland Great Britain because of that. That would be so good. It's so good. I really enjoy it. Yeah. And it has like a couple jump scares. Yeah. Like the little it's girl and the so... seance. <laughs> and the little kids playing um, their, the actors' names were Alakina Mann and James Bentley playing uh, Grace's children, Nicole Kidman's kids. And um, also, <laughs> this movie caused me to be fascinated by Victorian era death portraiture. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And I wrote a paper on it at the time because I was in college. And now I know a whole lot of things about that, which I wish I didn't really know. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) It is super interesting, though. I know. Yeah. Oh, oh, cool. Good one, Summers. I got to do a rewatch. I haven't seen that in a long time. So this is The Ghoul's Guide to Santa Barbara. And I'm Liz. I'm Jen. I'm Summers. And today, Jen (laughs) is going to tell us about Norman Paulson and the Brotherhood of the Sun. Yes. And actually, it's uh, it's great that that you chose a Nicole Kidman film because we're going to have a like teeny hint of a crossover in that she was married in to the Tom Cruise. Oh. Oh. The different cult. <laughs> oh, Noted they... cult member. <laughs> OK. And OK. So here's here's another just quick thing before I get started. So one thing that's going to come up in this story is the idea of. <laughs> UFOlogy, which oh. is in print, capital U, capital F, capital O, L O G Y. How would you pronounce that? Ufology. 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 You, fo- you fool. What? <laughs> <laughs> it. It was just like my brain had a hard time even reading it when I wasn't saying it out loud. But so I was like, I have to ask you guys how Uf- you would pronounce that. Ufology. That's what I want to say, okay. but it reads like okay so my guess was ufology and that's apparently how you say it but funny i don't actually know because you know like you look up pronounce blah or whatever and then it's just like some random like seo (laughs) trap yeah video or whatever so maybe it's not correct yeah you don't have to click on it but that's my guess (laughs) so yeah so (laughs) in my i'm not gonna try but picture (laughs) stuff on (laughs) <laughs> this story has everything. <laughs> and that's what we're going to get into. If you happen to be driving on California State Route 1 toward Lompoc, just about 10 minutes after the Highway 101 interchange, you might notice a small unassuming sign at the intersection of a street announcing the entrance to the Sunburst Sanctuary. And you might, if you are like me, wonder what exactly this place, nestled among the rolling oak dotted hills and between the ranches and farms, actually is. I don't think I've ever driven the one up there. <laughs> <laughs> I have a picture. I stopped the last time I drove by and grabbed a picture for you guys. I remember and then quickly picture. ducked back into my car when a <laughs> truck came out. Oh my gosh, that's terrifying. <laughs> and we'll put that on our socials. <laughs> Currently, according to its website, Sunburst is a community of practice dedicated to personal and planetary awakening with headquarters at Sunburst Sanctuary <laughs> north of Santa Barbara. Listen, wait, listeners, I wish you could see Summer's face right now. <laughs> I just have no patience for woo-woo crap. I cannot. Oh, no. Oh, this might be hard, hard for one. you. 
<laughs> no, I think I'll enjoy it. Like I'll love to hate it. It'll be good. It'll be good. They are labeled as a retreat center online and they offer programs including meditation, <laughs> classes in sacred geometry, Fuck and you. all cl- <laughs> no, wait, 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 wait. Sorry. And all clans flute gathering. <gasps> And what they call karma yoga, which is an opportunity to engage in selfless service and cooperative community. What? No. I feel like I need to integrate these. In short, Sunburst is considered the last great California hippie commune, outlasting most of these idealistic communal living havens that sprung up in the 60s and 70s. Is it a cult? Is it an organic (laughs) farm? Is it a multi-million dollar business? Mm -hmm. Is it a haven of cultural appropriation captained by a narcissistic drug addict? That one. Is it aliens? Yeah. Also aliens. I'd like it to be aliens. <laughs> it might just be all of this and more. Oh, boy. <laughs> so I need to just put it out there that I secretly want to start a commune. Oh, me too. No, I'm not a commune, a cult. I want to start a cult with oh, no. you. <laughs> and I want to make a lot of money. But I want it to be something like pleasant and harmless and have nothing to do with healing stones or astrology or and like, having oh, people sign over their like just, just wealth like, to you and also have sex with you and that yeah, would be multiple I mean, the, spouses. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would like the, it to be an affordable housing cult. Yes. yes. The idea of communal living like it's so it's very clearly the way that we were biologically designed to live. Uh-huh. Like the further we get from that, the harder Takes lives become. I do a lot of, you know, work with parenting groups and like I feel like so much of the stress of modern parenting is just because we've strayed so far from communal living and communities and intergenerational living. Oh, yeah. And, oh, and so like but. I don't want to give any <laughs> indication that I you know, that I'm against communes or I don't want to mock because, because like I said, this is still an existing community and Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want anyone (laughs) to feel that I, that I'm mocking them. Um, Oh yeah. But Uh, the fact of the matter is that their founder is troublesome. And so in order to understand a sunburst in its current iteration, we have to start with Norman Paulson. (laughs) Wow. 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 (laughs) Communes. Yeah. There was a book in my high school library about communes. And I remember reading it and being like, that sounds cool. Uh-huh. But like, I don't want to parent other people's kids. I don't want the, it takes a village. Like, mm-mm. Yeah, it's not, for, <laughs> it's not for everyone. And yeah, like you, I feel like you have to go into it, like making sure everyone is on the same yeah, page. Yeah, on board. So in order to understand Sunburst in its current iteration, we need to start with Norman Paulson. Norman was born in 1929 and grew up in Lompoc, As a child, he claimed to be visited by illuminated beings who used visions to teach him skills or offer guidance. Here we go. (laughs) I'm so sorry. I hate it. I'm I'm trying not to interject as much over like your beautiful narrative, (laughs) but like, can I? Oh, okay. I'm going to (laughs) stop. I'm just going to warn you. Like, yeah, if I'm just going to dissociate during the rest of this. (laughs) (laughs) mm -hmm. This is just the beginning. He even claimed to be visited by Jesus Christ himself. Oh, f- him. <laughs> Sorry, not Jesus. I mean, I'm going to edit that out. Could you say that one again? I stepped on you. He even claimed to be visited by Jesus Christ himself. When he turned 16, he joined the Merchant Marines and traveled to Asia and the Middle East. He later enlisted in the Navy and served for about two years until his mother passed away and he was honorably discharged. Those things were adjacent in the resource that I pulled this for. I don't think he got honors honorably discharged because his mom passed away. I think these things just kind of mm-hmm. aligned at the same time. <laughs> in 1947, Norman reads Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, which I, pro- I'm, I apologize if I pronounce that wrong who was a Hindu monk, yogi, and guru who immigrated to the U.S. at age 27 to spread Eastern religion and practices to the West. He's known as the father of yoga in the West. Hmm. That's interesting. There's a Vedanta temple in Montecito. No, not Montecito. Up by Franceschi a little bit. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that's related. I don't know. Could possibly don't know. be. Yogananda runs the Self-Realization Fellowship in Los Angeles And Norman Paulson is so inspired by his autobiography that he moves to the Mount Washington Monastery to be initiated as Uh, a monk. No. (laughs) (laughs) There he studies Kriya yoga, meditation, reads about multiple worldwide religions, and learns gardening, carpentry, and construction. So it's kind of a 
communal living situation down there. Okay. In 1951, he helped them build one of the first vegetarian restaurants in all of California, <laughs> SRF's India House Cafe. That's okay with me. That one part <laughs> yeah. is fine. Yeah. Part of the teachings at SRF encouraged that communal brotherhood colonies could cure society of selfishness and consumerism. And during this time there, Norman has a dream where he saw young people living oh. on the land near Santa Barbara. Norman continues his studies and eventually <laughs> is pronounced a minister in the SRF. But by 1951, he starts to have disagreements with Yogananda, including over the requirement to maintain chastity. Hmm. Red flag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. Dick. <laughs> and he leaves the group to head north. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, so that's like, I mean, we've run into that a little bit before, actually, with um, like the, the whole planned, oh, what am I trying to say? Planned... Um, utopian community it's yeah. just like mm-hmm. another flavor of that right and yeah. like they always run into trying mm-hmm. to bone everybody and yes like, oh <laughs> yeah and also when like when somebody like splits off because r- right for something so specific like that like yeah oh, i can't have sex with anybody <laughs> let me just take all of these pieces and start my own thing let me just take the children it'll be fine to bone them oh, far yeah. away God. there's there's gonna be a lot of picking and choosing yeah. of religions and cultures and people tend to do yeah Mm -hmm. uh norman spends some time working odd jobs in construction and masonry before making his way to santa barbara where he soon has what he describes in one of his many autobiographies another red flag as a direct quote-unquote direct encounter with i am that i am christ the divine solar logos divine mother and father Um, Popeye. Popeye. (laughs) Sweet. <laughs> I mean, if this was like a cult solely developed uh, to worship and follow the teachings of Popeye, I might be on board. <laughs> May I just say that as much as I am like angry about <laughs> what you are saying, I love this topic. I'm so glad you picked this topic. It is fascinating. And I had no idea about I, it. Let me tell you, I was so excited to dive into this. <laughs> The 1950s are basically a chapter in Norman's life that sounds like it's pulled directly from an episode of Ancient Aliens. (laughs) (laughs) Yay! Now, I am not generally a fan of cult leaders. They all seem to be cut from pretty much the same cloth. Mm -hmm. So I kind of assumed that I would find out that what would start as a guy with some maybe self-serving, maybe sincere desire to start a new religion eventually gets wrapped up in the attention and power and inevitably we would end up with child brides and standoffs with local government <laughs> and trust me we will get there too oh boy oh, no. <laughs> but i somehow did not anticipate the left turn into ufos and the amount of time i would spend reading scholarly articles about him hanging out and discussing the apocalypse with little green men wow remind <laughs> me when you get to the part about standoffs i have a joke <laughs> great <laughs> okay. can't wait it's a good one <laughs> So in 1952, Norman travels to Giant Rock, California with his friend Daniel Boone, not that one, to meet George W. Van Tassel after reading his publication, I Wrote a Flying Saucer, about his contact with a UFO. Wait, Van Tassel, isn't that like from Sleepy Hollow? (laughs) Did one of them live, the Van Tassels? (laughs) You completely missed the fact that the other guy's name was Daniel Boone. No, 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 we didn't. You told us not that one. We both were like, "Ah." Uh, yeah. <laughs> and also like what what was the name of the place? Like Rot? Giant Rock. Giant, oh, Giant Rock, California. That? I was like Giant Rot. Uh, so, it's out in the Yucca Valley. Okay. okay. And Daniel and Norman spend a weekend out there with George and his wife Eve, who had moved to the desert while employed by Howard Hughes what? to seek contact with aliens. You're to t- Wait, I okay. swear, I, fe- I feel like I had a fever dream and made this whole thing up. You just pulled like a bunch of random things out of a hat and like stuck them together. <laughs> so they had moved to the desert to meet aliens of their own accord. Howard Hughes didn't necessarily employ them to seek contact with aliens. It was two separate things. That was a little unclear. Okay. It, they just, it, the reason, the, the, I read a lot of, like I said, I read a, read a lot of like, academic articles yeah. about this. Did you sign up like, to join the cult? <laughs> I might have accidentally <laughs> just to download one of these articles. Uh-huh. <laughs> I now have a subscription to like academia.net or something. You're on the mailing list. <laughs> yeah. That's probably not a cult though. It might be. <laughs> Academia might be a cult. Mm-hmm. So they're enthralled with this. You guys, I'm just... <laughs> 
getting to the point where I don't even know if I can say some of these words. So they're enthralled with the story (laughs) of George's meeting an extraterrestrial and touring the spaceship it arrived in. And they attend a presentation he gives to an audience of 200 gathered to hear his account. Okay. Okay. I hate him. Fasten your seatbelts. Wait, I just Googled Giant Rock California and it, there's a picture that we'll definitely share. <laughs> giant but, Rock. But like the little little snippet here just says massive freestanding desert boulder sacred to Native Americans <laughs> and at the center of UFO conspiracies. What an accurate wow. naming for a giant rock. Yes. <laughs> okay, so you guys are ready? Uh-huh. Yep. Coincidentally... On their way back to Santa Barbara at the end of the weekend, Norman and his buddy Daniel stop to pick up a hitchhiker who just happens to be an alien named Waldo. (laughs) Jen's losing it. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) I lost my place. Even when I wrote, when I typed this up, I knew it was going to be hard to get through this. Okay. (laughs) Discovering that his spacecraft had been destroyed... No. Norman describes Waldo in his autobiography. The figure was male, approximately five feet tall and very slender. The age was difficult to determine because the facial features were so different from what the ordinary human beings look like. His head was bare, (laughs) revealing closely cut hair. The crown of his head was pointed very visibly above a broad forehead. His (laughs) eyes were small, darting, deep set and exceedingly wide apart. His cheekbones wide set also, tapering down to an extremely narrow pointed chin. His ears were unusually large and pointed. Is he Dobby the house elf? (laughs) (laughs) He had no luggage. It was dressed casually in a one-piece coverall. Stop it. (laughs) They found an alien named Waldo. Hitchhiking. Wearing just basic human clothes. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe he was a painter. Summer is so... (laughs) I don't they, even know the word. They then claim that seeing as how Waldo never slept, seemed to be always agitated and was expecting imminent rescue, he'd be better off at the Van Tassel's house than with them. So they drove him back out to Great Rock and left Great Rock and left him there. Oh, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't like I don't know take a bunch of pictures and maybe drop him off at the local news station. Well, I mean, it didn't happen. I know. <laughs> After delivering an actual alien to Van Tassel, Norman decides to move to the desert and join the UFO study group in 1953, marries and later divorces George's daughter Glenda, with whom he had a son, and he and Daniel Boone spend the next 10 or so years of their lives sleeping under the stars and working casually to encounter aliens. Hmm. I didn't know that like hanging out waiting to meet aliens was a job. Because I would like Howard Hughes to hire me to do this work. Wait, so Howard Hughes was I don't paying know. for that? We're I don't not know. sure. Okay. Yeah. We're unaware of where their funding is currently okay. coming from. <laughs> so Norman claims during this time he encounters multiple alien ships, although he is not brought aboard. He's given insight into what is known to scholars as the ancient astronaut theory, an early history of the world and origin of humanity in which extraterrestrials called the Builders human angel beings and the nephilim 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 i think uh no it's spelled more like nephilim you're you, you're probably right it's like a race of angels yeah oh either designed human beings entirely or augmented their development through experimentation and interbreeding this sounds like the movie prometheus oh sounds One like of the a alien lot of movies, movies. The beings told Norman that 500,000 years ago, they came to Earth to establish an ideal civilization, the lost continent of Mu, spelled M-U. F*** off (laughs) to these people. But that eventually war with an invading intergalactic malignant force caused them to leave. (laughs) They told him one day the ancients would return and his job was to help prepare the way for their return. When an apocalyptic battle would take place between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. Now, we all know I love science fiction, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I like to keep it in my fiction category. Yeah. It's not surprising that during this time, Norman and his buddies are developing this focus on aliens. We are, of course, in the Cold War era of the 1950s, where mounting tensions between the U.S. and Russia is framed as a struggle between good and evil and ushered in multiple UFO 
religions, including the Aetherius Society in London and the Church of Scientology in America, founded by 1954 by L. Ron Hubbard. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't actually put that together, that that was like the Cold War was related to uh, space alien crap. Alien religions. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. So, like I said, I read a lot about all of the stuff that he mm-hmm. claims and he believes. And man, I just... Speaking of Tom Cruise, <laughs> I just literally am to the point now where I can't even watch a Tom Cruise movie. Oh, yeah. Because I am completely and utterly distracted by the fact that this man believes this bullshit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I feel the same about anything with Elizabeth Moss. That's I know. I just can't really watch her. Yeah. I, I couldn't watch Handmaid's Tale because I was like, you're in a cult. <laughs> I can't watch you be in a movie about... How cults are bad. Yeah. 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 So, anyways. As... We enter the 1960s. Norman Paulson's encounters with aliens and their spaceships continues to <laughs> intensify. On January 1st, 1961, Norman meets with an alien female named Elithia. It's spelled capital E dash L-I-T-H dash capital E capital A. Who guides him on a 40 day initiation where he has alien objects placed in his body. Mm. And his butt? Was it his butt? In quotes, I put, is this anal probing? Yeah. What is it with the anal probing? What is it? And is, quote unquote, circumcised by a ring of fire from the presence of a divine spirit. What? It sounds to me like Norman had an acid trip. Oh, yeah. And an STD. And, yeah, and developed an STD. <laughs> It's during this encounter that he is told that soon the aliens would return with an army of ships to deliver the final ultimatum to Lucifer and Satan, who have had possession over the earth for over 12,000 years. uh, Yeah, I will say this is interesting because I haven't I don't think anyway, I don't think that I have heard of like mixing Christian mythology with space aliens before. Yeah, It seems like it's been separate. It really just seems to be like throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. (laughs) Yeah. I'm interested in that. And at this point, he, he hasn't established the the cult oh, no, of the we commune. Haven't okay, there yet. Okay, this so is he, his origin story. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. He tells Boone and Van Tassel and the rest of the community at Great Rock about this encounter and this prediction. However, they quote unquote did not recognize the truth of his visions, hmm. but thought him crazy and sent him away. And those are his own words <laughs> from his autobiography. I love it. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to do a quick change of pace, which I am going to call literary burns. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and so uh, I'm going to read you a quote from Carol M. Kuzak, who wrote an article called Norman Paulson and the Brotherhood of the Sun, which I used as a reference. And the quote is, it is reasonable to, sus- to speculate that Paulson was aware of the power of the memoir as a personal testimony and that, as many spiritual teachers without formal college or university qualifications have done, he wrote an autobiography intended to impress and persuade potential converts. Yeah. <laughs> sick burn, Carol, <laughs> sick burn. Wait, why is that a burn? Because she's basically like... He doesn't have any formal college or university qualifications, so he had to rely on this to get his converts. Like, I feel like a lot of these articles had kind of like little like thinly digs veiled. where they like point out that he was uneducated or that he was basically m- making all this crap up. But like, I don't know. I'm not looking for university credentials in my cult leaders. Like, <laughs> is there um, a track record of cult leaders who went to college doing better? I don't know. No, I think it's just, just like a respectability. That, like, yeah, exactly. Like hmm. he had to huh. kind of like build himself up because he didn't have credentials to fall on. Because now he's a published author. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder also, though, like when you're reading a memoir, it's very like an intimate experience for the reader, right? Like you feel very connected uh, oh, to yeah. the person yeah. and feel like kind of like FDR's fireside. <laughs> it's like you feel like they're talking to you. Yeah. That personal I feel that way when I read the forward to Stephen King books. So, Hmm. yeah. Yeah. Interesting. He's my book dad. Would you join (laughs) his cult? Oh, for sure. (laughs) After leaving the desert, Norman Paulson has a tough time getting things on track. He's living in poverty, working as a bricklayer in 1964. And one night he overdoses on his sleeping meds and ends up in the hospital receiving a tracheotomy. 
During the procedure, he claims to have had a near-death vision of his body floating above him and three men in robes ushered him into the light of eternity. He wakes up later in leather restraints, transferred to the Camarillo State Psychiatric oh, Hospital, oh where he is involuntarily held for 90 days. Okay. Is that now the CS, Cal State mm-hmm. Channel Islands? Yeah. Yes. yes. Even still, he believes the builders need him to create a community that can be used as a base station for the return of the ancients. Oh, my goodness. Eventually, back in Santa Barbara, Norman is teaching meditation and leading spiritual discussion groups targeted at troubled youth. Yet another red flag. Oh, man. He himself is 40 years old, six foot four and almost 300 pounds. And a former member says, quote, many of us came from broken homes and were searching for the security we never had in our Mm -hmm. own families. Mm -hmm. At that time, Norm was a very strong father figure for all of us, end quote. In 1969, he and this ragtag group of followers formed the Brotherhood of the Sun. The name is meant to invoke both the spiritual sun, the white light of creation, and Jesus, the Son of God. It's during this time the group starts meeting in an old ice cream factory, which Paulson was living in, which I believe to be the old McConnell's building, maybe mm. off Milpas, mm-hmm. but I couldn't confirm the with location. The, with the cow on with top? The cow. Yeah, yeah, that's what I kind of pictured it in Let's- my head. Agree that that's where it was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they support themselves working odd jobs in construction, house cleaning, etc. But members decide they would really like to buy a farm, start a commune, and grow and sell organic foods. Oh, me too. Right? So in 1970, Norman buys an 160-acre farm oh. near Santa Barbara with money he gets from a workers' comp settlement and donations from his followers. Okay. He got run over by Alexis. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting because uh, I read like it's framed as like, oh, he bought this farm with mm-hmm. this money and some donations. But like the same person who I quoted earlier mm-hmm. in an article said that Norman got like six grand for his workers comp oh. settlement. <laughs> and this person's mom put in 50,000. Oh, wow. wow. So like it sounds like maybe the donations or what really <laughs> yeah. funded this purchase. But he had some buy-in. Yeah, a little right? bit. <laughs> they fronted a little bit. <sighs> uh, Norman tells them the ancestral intergalactic beings support this project. <sighs> and later the next year, they upgrade to a new, bigger location they call Lemuria Ranch. Lemuria Ranch? Spell Is it, it like L-E-M-U-R-I-A? L-E-M-U-R-I-A. Uh-huh. Lemuria? Were there lemurs there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll just call it Lima Ranch. Um <laughs> In 1971, they are incorporated as a religious nonprofit and create Sunburst Natural Foods as the for-profit corporation for their new member-run health food business. Oh, okay. So I'm half like <laughs> consumed with hatred, like <laughs> flames on the sides of my face. <laughs> um, but also, I'm also a little jealous. Like I would like a farm, and I would like my my uh, community for. So we're living in autistic people. Yeah. Like, I want that. <laughs> yeah. And it's not possible. Mine would be around art, I think. Yeah. Now we're getting okay. to the part of the story <laughs> where I support the members and I still yeah. dislike Norman. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So they open Sunburst Community Store and also a trucking company, Sunburst Natural Foods, which ships their organic produce and dry goods to stores and restaurants across the United States. Huh. They continue to amass their quote unquote natural foods empire throughout the 70s, upgrading to a 2000 acre farm, opening two local restaurants, a whole grain bakery, a dairy and a fruit juice bottling company (laughs) where they sell sunburst, organic apple juice and orange juice, which sold well nationwide. That sounds familiar to me. So one of the sunburst community stores, and Uh I I think I have a picture somewhere here, um, was on the corner of Hollister which is now a uh, auto parts store. I have little chills. Maybe we went. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk in a future episode about my mom's obsession with uh, Adele Davis. And I realize I have like exposed myself for having mom issues. I didn't even know I had <laughs> on this podcast, but um, like, yeah, around the same time, Santa Barbara had like some weird, crunchy, yeah, health foodie stuff. Oh, and it's probably 90% of it was them. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. I bet. Members lived and worked at the ranch and mostly weren't paid. However, they were provided (laughs) housing, organic meals, clothing, and medical care. Well, medical care, I mean. Yeah. And 
Okay. Isn't like like in culty situations too, like controlling the food is like a big thing though. Like oh, you keep sure. people hungry and mm. like relying on you for that. And you know, like when you're hungry and you're just like, Ugh, yeah. like your brain just doesn't work right. And oh, The Vow. Yes. The HBO yes. series where uh, Keith Ranieri kept the women really thin desperately underweight yeah. yes. so they couldn't think right exactly yeah. yeah and he controlled what they ate like yeah yeah that's yeah. the thing i mean i don't i don't know if there's that because like these people are literally working and right. growing the food and then eating the food from their own okay. farm but yeah they they are very dependent but if that's, on it yeah if that's they're depending on him and yeah. they have no money to buy other food yeah exactly and they live there so they live yeah. under a community morality and rule structure, advocating oh. for healthy communal living with no drugs, alcohol, or tobacco, eating nutritious vegetarian meals, which I heard that like they started out as this like lacto, over, like mm. they had very strict rules and then right. like it kind of over time got a little less uh, restrictive mm. as far as what they could eat. Okay. But they lived simply and attuned with nature, dressed <laughs> plainly, and did not engage in pre or extramarital sex. They also practiced yoga and meditation huh? together daily. And at one point, membership reached almost 350 followers. Wow. By 1976, they had brought in over $3 million and once again moved to an even larger 3,000 acre farm called Tahegas Ranch. Hmm. Next, one member wrote the first of many cookbooks, the Sunburst Farm Family Cookbook. And Paulson hmm. bought, fixed up, and then sold four different ships which they used to support their seafood industry, Sunburst Pierce Fisheries, and also chartered for pleasure cruises. Hmm. None of that. There was no crashes. So unfortunately, this story does <laughs> no not mar- involve a shipwreck. <laughs> a maritime disaster. <laughs> yeah. By Jen. Yes. <laughs> Those are my fave episodes. This like, one's good, though. Ships, though. I was like, ships, where does... Like, L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I feel like he kind of took a lot of that Seal. on. Yeah. Um, so... There's, I have some pictures also, which I'll share. Like some of them were, look like, you know, like schooners, like tall ships and they like would buy these things. And then, oh, here's one on the cover of one of his autobiographies. Sorry, it's small, but um, yeah, like they would buy these ships and like fix them up. And that would be like another job for these people to do like here, make this boat nice. Gosh, um, yeah. And then they would like tape, take people out to the islands and stuff. Um, so, however, it's also during this time that Norman's behavior continues getting more and more erratic. He allegedly began stockpiling weaponry oh, and boy. had a member that had served in the military start running drills with the community on the farm. <laughs> Although no alcohol, drugs, or tobacco were permitted on the group's property, it was beginning to be well known among the members that Norman had a serious drug and drinking problem. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so that whole do as I say, not as I do. Mm-hmm. The rules are for you guys, but not for me kind of thing. Though he claimed that as he is, you guys are just prepared to really hate him even more. Okay. <laughs> Though he claimed that as he had stepped away from the business side of things to focus on the spiritual growth and counseling of his followers, his addiction was a direct result of absorbing their negative energy. Oh, Basically, he blamed them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Later, members who supported Paulson through this time would refer to his struggles as comparable to that of what Jesus, too, endured. No. Both men <laughs> suffered for their people and, quote unquote, gave too much to others and absorbed all their bad karma. Yeah. And like famously, the disciples had to go to Al-Anon because <laughs> Jesus was such a raging alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Huh. Norman also began referring to himself as Christ more often. Oh, oh that's good. And that, that he good. rode in spaceships with the builders as one of the ancient rulers of Mu, the lost continent, which would be reincarnated as the Garden of Eden on Earth. He was also accused of brandishing weapons in public, sexually abusing minors and uh-huh. tax there evasion. It there nope. it is. I mean, this is kind of like if we were going for cult bingo. Yeah. Yeah. The playbook. Uh-huh. Yep. It's during this time that Sunburst is investigated by anti-cult groups due to the bad publicity, leading to two minor members being kidnapped by famed deprogrammer Ted Patrick. Huh. Oh, Ted Patrick. I don't know Wait, oh. Famed <laughs> deprogrammer. Do you really know who this person is? <laughs> <laughs> He's famed. Uh, in 1978, Norman is out driving while drunk, and when the police <laughs> try to pull him over, he instead drives to the farm and initiates a standoff with oh, police. Wow. Q- oh, you. okay. One time I was in a coffee shop. Uh, bathroom. I've told you this before, but I, the listeners, I haven't. I don't know if it's going to stand up to my hype about it. But um, there was a chalkboard, and someone had written 
Waco in all capitals and then like out from the letters like Waco W A C O like top to bottom and then just wrote what a cookout. Oh, oh no. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> and I laugh about that like probably three times a year. <laughs> So Norman's ranting about the coming apocalypse. (laughs) He's eventually charged with drunk driving and resisting arrest. After this incident, as well as the People's Temple mass suicide in Guyana around the same time, Mm. the community is under increasing scrutiny. And that's the Jim Jones thing, right? Yes, that is the Jonestown massacre. Tensions between the outside world are additionally increased in 1980 during the presidential campaign as the current location of Sumber's Farms is adjacent to Ronald Reagan's ranch in the San Inez Mountains. <laughs> oh, <laughs> amazing. I was wondering where they were at this point. Yeah. So they're yeah. like just bopping around. Yeah. Okay. Even though by this point, Sunburst had earned over $16 million through 12 wholesale and retail outlets in five cities, growing concerns about their leader's mental state caused members and store employees to seek safety nets in their communities, and they attempt to unionize, claiming that the company does not fairly distribute its profits. Right. (laughs) Many members leave outright, and others file grievances about anti-union intimidation. By 1981, membership is down by two-thirds. Mm -hmm. The farm's profits dwindle due to labor woes, high inflation, and the impending recession. Mm -hmm. A lawsuit is eventually filed by over 70 former members seeking $1.3 million in owed profits. This lawsuit is later dismissed. However, a separate suit concerning their inability to pay debts caused the eventual sale of Sunburst Farms to Higas Ranch. By 1982, Sunburst has liquidated all other California properties. It's stated in the article I read by Carol Cusack that not all residents of Sunburst Farms or employees in the organic food business were believers in Paulson's vision and that the farms and ranches were holy places. I imagine they were just like hippie surfers who wanted a slice of California Mm -hmm. commune life. And we kind of touched on that Mm -hmm. on our you know, episode of just kind of like people who join things, but maybe don't fully 100% support the vision of the founder. That's a good point. Here's another little scholarly burn just because (laughs) one of the quotes from an article I will link to on our website notes that in regards to one of his seven, yes, seven autobiographies, (laughs) quote unquote, from a bricklayer untrained in the literary arts, his work reveals a pathology of self acclimation and self deception. (laughs) This first autobiography, titled simply Sunburst, seems to be almost a desperate attempt to legitimize his beliefs and rebuild his fan base. Hmm. So they're kind of struggling. He's trying. He's like, I'm going to write this autobiography and tell everyone how great I am. And then they'll want to join me. Yeah. (sighs) So it's then that Paulson and about 100 of his most committed members relocate to a large cattle ranch in Wells, Nevada and a mobile home park in nearby Oasis, where they run a gas station, a mini mart, a restaurant, and a hotel. This ranch is less fitting for their previous agricultural endeavors, and the long cold winters and short growing season test their ability to produce products the way they had hoped. Within a year, there's a lien on the property, and most of them quickly relocate to Salt Lake City, Utah, where they rename themselves The Builders. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Towards the end of the 80s and into the 90s, membership dwindles further and the approximately two to three dozen remaining members abandon farming to manage an apartment complex they also live in. Two two or three? Two to three dozen. Oh, okay. Sorry. (laughs) While some in the inner circle share a four-story mansion. They begin to end pooling their resources and members take jobs flipping houses, running an excavation business, and offering yoga and meditation retreats. Some go with what they know and open several natural food stores named New Frontiers. These eventually spread to Arizona, where a few members move and open three stores between 88 and 95. What were they named? New Frontiers. That's how Jen says frontier. Oh, really? Uh Uh-huh. Okay. (laughs) What did I say? You say frontier. You say it all the time. Frontier. Yeah. Yeah, Frontier. Frontier. But that's okay. It's like a front. The front. (laughs) That's just how you say it. (laughs) Whoa. It's okay, though. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Norman hops around between Salt Lake and Las Vegas, but eventually returns to California in 1988, supposedly to look for land for a new commune. Though one article interviewed him from his Ocean View condo in Ventura, where he collected <laughs> ties from the remaining members and oversaw the remodeling of his current sailing ship. Ties is like money? Oh, yes. Okay. I heard ties. Or neckties. Like neckties? Yeah. Okay. Here, I'll do it again. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> the one article interviewed Frank. 
I'm going to add a word in there. Okay. The one article I read had interviewed him from his Ocean View condo in Ventura, mm. where he collected tithes from the remaining members and oversaw the remodeling of his current sailing ship. <laughs> uh, when? How can I get into a situation where I'm collecting tithes <laughs> in your from, Ocean View from start some a, members? Start a religion, <laughs> form a cult. Yeah. Okay. In 1991, he renamed the group again, this time as Solar Logos, and Ugh. buys both a 53-acre ranch near Buellton he calls Sunburst Farm and a second property near Nahui Falls called New Frontiers Farms to raise organic <laughs> produce for their markets. And let's all take a moment to discuss how everyone else pronounced Nahui. Because <laughs> that's another <laughs> local Santa Barbara-ism oh, where yeah. lots of yeah. people pronounce it differently. I've heard Nahoki. <laughs> I like that one. I like that one. For listeners, it's spelled like Nojaqui. Yes, it is spelled N-O-J-O-Q-U-I, and I assume that is from its regional dialect, likely Chumash. That's, um, so it's the same thing with Refugio, Refugio. Like, there's just, at least on Reddit, I found like a lot of really different stuff, but about like why the pronunciation is mm-hmm. the way it is. And yes, that one, which I don't know how, I've never been there, so I don't have to say it very much, but just, is it like Nahoe? Is that, I don't know. I say that's Nahoe how I've because it. we used to go there all the time up to the falls and do the hike with my family and that's okay. how they said it. So, uh-huh. okay. Yeah. I've heard Nahoe. I've heard Chumash pronunciation, but like, again, these are just like people on Reddit. Yeah. Comments. Mm-hmm. There's no source. So I don't know. If I'm pronouncing it wrong. I apologize. If someone can correct me, I would honestly love to know what it should actually be, and I will adopt that. (laughs) By 1996, most of the remaining members have moved back to California as well. Since then, New Frontiers has supplied the bulk of Sunburst's income, and when running the out-of-state stores became too difficult, they were sold to the Wild Oats National Grocery Chain. Norman wed three more times after (laughs) Mr. Van Tassel's daughter, Glenda. He married Lisa... No last name given in my research in October of 1959. And then they divorced in December 1960. Then on their joint birthday, February 3rd, 1972, he married Mary, (laughs) who would later be called Mary Moo. Hmm. Finally, Patty, who joined Sunburst in 1975 when she was just 19. I didn't really get a lot into this, but I think a lot of these people were like, quote unquote members who came in and then were t- probably likely taken advantage by yeah leader. Sure. And we all we see this in so many he cults. was already an adult in the early 50s mm-hmm. so at this yeah. point he's at least in his 40s and 1929 yeah. I there think was, she said I, he was oh, okay i can't yeah. remember so gross mm-hmm. i don't want to get too much into that but yeah but why uh, not it sounds so <laughs> palatable <laughs> <laughs> so basically i say that Because when Norman died of pancreatic cancer in 2006, his widow, Patricia Paulson, took over as a spiritual as the spiritual leader and changed the name from Solar Logos to Sunburst Church of (sighs) Self-Realization. The website offers opportunities for the public to come to spiritual retreats and experience yoga, meditation and community with the remaining members in their sanctuary and retreat center at Sunburst Farms. In 2014, Sunburst sold all but one of their remaining New Frontier stores to Whole Foods. The single <laughs> remaining store oh. is located currently in Solving. And Whoa. you can go shop oh, there now. Oh, interesting. Okay. It's a Whole Foods now? Or just no, Whole, the other Whole ones were sold it. to full Whole oh, Foods. Okay. They still own the one in Solving. Got it. Yeah. So <laughs> these days, only about two dozen members live on the farm full time. Most of them in their, are in their 70s now. Mm. While the retreats, workshops, and gatherings may bring in some younger visitors, it's increasingly difficult to procure new committed members. Right. They still sell Norman's books on their website, and his big <laughs> smile appears in photos right on their homepage. However, there's no mention of extraterrestrials, and the promise of that looming apocalypse seems to have gone with Norman. <laughs> What remains is a small community of people living together and doing their best to be good to themselves, each other, and the planet. Regardless of its history, it's hard for even a cynic like me to find much fault in that. <laughs> hmm. And that is my that overview. That was so good. That was really, that was really good. Of the tumultuous life <laughs> of the sun burst. When you got to like sanctuary. The, the wife, Patricia, and then like 
him dying. I was like, wait, is this Patricia Bragg? <laughs> oh, no, no. no, yeah, that's another like local family that's health, really health food in yeah. health mm-hmm. food, organic yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. We got a, we got a lot of the woo woo around here. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it seems like um, yeah, mostly current members. Like they still they work the farm. They sell their <laughs> in their old foods. age. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, there's a few younger ones. It, there's a there's a couple uh, from like what I could uh, read on the website. It looks like uh, maybe there's some like families that had younger children and those people are still living there mm-hmm. um yikes oh yeah boy. <laughs> it was a it's a wild ride that is a wild ride holy moly that's so interesting thanks jen yeah oh. the health food industry especially like its beginnings i think it's just like some of it is so weird and yeah. i'm not surprised yeah that there is a i mean i'm surprised by the story and i hate that guy <laughs> <laughs> but like well, it it makes sense and like um, Patricia Bragg and like, yeah, Mm-mm. nope, <laughs> nope. I met her at the Earth Day Festival one year. Yeah. Didn't yeah. she get like the, the Just, big award? Yeah. At oh, Earth yeah. Day one year? yeah. We loved giving her awards yeah. Yeah. yeah, because she donated to like every nonprofit, like a little vinegar basket or something. <laughs> there's a, uh, there's a great episode of maintenance phase about her. Oh yeah. The Bragg family. Like the amino acids Maybe, and the yeah. vinegars. <laughs> Maybe we could link to that on yeah, our website. It. Great oh. podcast. Does uh, anybody have a question for the magic eight ball? Oh yeah. Was Waldo an alien? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. All right. Here we go. While you that shake. Part- oh, well, go. go ahead. Nope, you go. While you shake the eight ball, we have this old eight ball that has like really thick liquid in the middle of it. So we have to shake it a lot. But um, at the beginning of the story, I was so irritated and I had the same amount of irritation that I had when I read about George Harrison getting stabbed in his house. And all he did was like sing the Hare Krishna song while he was oh getting gosh. stabbed. What? He didn't defend himself. He just <gasps> laid there and really? like chanted. That's, oh. Whoa. I mean, I guess that's his business, but come but, yeah, on. Yeah, like self-preservation. <laughs> like, it's kind of pretty fundamental to oh. humans. <laughs> I was thinking of the movie, have you ever seen the movie Paul? With oh yes, I was thinking of that too. I haven't yeah. seen it, but I know what you mean. It's, it's pretty fun. I I mean I love I Simon, love Simon Pegg, Pegg and yeah. Nick Frost, and they mm-hmm. pick up a, they're like going to some like Comic Con type thing, and they pick up an, an alien hitchhiker in their RV, <laughs> like going Waldo? across the U.S. And his name's Paul. Paul. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's what I thought of too. Like that was my mental yeah. picture. Except I was also just thinking of a person, and also thinking like this didn't happen. Yeah, so, <laughs> right. Yeah. All of that too. I okay. just love, like, I just love the whole like we came out here to meet this. Like they came, they went out, they met this guy who claimed to have had this experience. They clearly were enamored with this guy, and then like they just happened to meet an alien yeah. on the way home. I like uh, I like in that movie. There's a part where they're talking to like some like redneck dude in his big truck, you know, Mm -hmm. with his like, and he says, he asks him something about like, like, Oh, you know, like British cops don't even carry guns. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. like they never shoot people. And like Simon Pegg or one of them is just like, well, we try not to. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like like it's that easy. Just like try, just try not to shoot people. Right. (laughs) (laughs) When I um, first moved to England, yeah, it was like mm, pre nine 11. So almost no, UK cops had guns. And I remember very clearly, like exactly where I was sitting when I asked my friend Laura, well, why do you do what they say then? Uh And she was like, (laughs) what? (gasps) I really, I guess like at that point in my life, I just felt like you would only obey a cop because he could shoot you. (laughs) You guys don't live in constant fear of death by cop? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All right. Was Waldo an alien? Mm Mm-hmm. Outlook good. Oh. I dispute that. I disown the magic eight ball. Oh man, <laughs> that's it. I'm I'm subscribing. To oh no, <laughs> the cult of ancient aliens. Oh man. That oh, that a, was so good. Yeah, that's a wild story. This week, if oh, everything yeah. goes as planned, we'll be sharing our um, live show from downtown Santa Barbara. Yay. So right. yeah, we're look. so excited about this opportunity. Yeah. yeah. So nice. Look so for join us for some spooky hangs. We're gonna tell you some stories. Yep. And we'll mm-hmm. get ready for Halloween. And we have some fun merch to share too. Yeah, a little bit. A little tiny bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, and uh win your own terrible and inaccurate magic apple. 
That's right. We're going <laughs> to give one away at the live show. So come on down to State Street and join us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You can get uh, more information on that. Show notes from this episode. Lots of uh, other cool stuff on our website at coolestguidetosb.com. Yep. yep. Like and subscribe us on <laughs> your favorite podcasts. And we'll see you next time. Did you say hi, mom? I was going to skip one. Oh, okay. Because I was like, is it weird that I do it every time? Is that going to be my thing? Yeah, you have to do it now. Okay. Hi, mom. (laughs) Thanks for listening to The Ghoul's Guide to Santa Barbara. Like and subscribe on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Ghoul's Guide to SB. Our website is ghoulsguidetosb.com. Got a spooky story or know of a haunted or paranormal location in Santa Barbara? Send it to us at ghoulsguidetosb at gmail.com.